Hello, everyone, and greetings from Peru. First, thank you to LabRoots and the sponsors for the opportunity to present to you the work that we're carrying out in Lima, Peru. My name is Pablo Sukayama, and I'm Assistant Professor of Microbiology at Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia and the Institute for Tropical Medicine in Lima. Uh, the work I'm going to tell you about is on an ongoing outbreak of Klebsiella pneumonia infections that also happen to be carbapenem resistant, have provided a great challenge to clinicians down there and how we are using genomics technologies and bioinformatics to understand the transmission dynamics of these pathogens. But first, why Klebsiella pneumonia and why carbapenem resistance? Well, because it is a very complicated pathogen that causes a lot of problems in hospitals worldwide. The CDC back in 2013 determined that it is an urgent threat to public health. And this is because certain strains of Klebsiella worldwide are becoming more virulent and are becoming increasingly resistant to antibiotics, which is something we don't only see in Klebsiella, but also in many other uh, pathogenic bacteria. This slide right here shows you a timeline in blue of the year when an antibiotic class was first deployed throughout the 20th century, and in red is the year when clinicians started seeing resistance in the clinic to these same antibiotics. As you can see, for all of them, antibiotic resistance eventually uh, develops over time in just a matter of 5, 10, 15 years. So it's not really a matter of whether resistance will happen, it's when it will happen. And this is the case uh, for all antibiotics in recent decades. To compound the problem, uh, it's a fact that we have not many new antibiotic classes in the pipelines, in the research pipelines. And this is because the golden era of antibiotics, which happened sometime in the 60s and 70s, is really now long gone. We discovered most of the antibiotic classes that are used today. And ever since then, we have not been able to keep that pace of discovery of new classes. And instead, what we've been using in recent decades is the modification, targeted modification of existing antibiotic backbones. That's how penicillins, over the course of many generations of development, turn into third and fourth generation penicillins, like cupiracillin, same for cephalosporins, same for tetracyclines. And so over the years, we are able to develop new variants of these molecules that somehow overcome drug resistance that evolved in, in pathogens. But we cannot do this indefinitely. At some point, we run out of new variants, and, and certain classes of antibiotics become obsolete. And a very worrying report came out of the UK just some five years ago, where it determined the burden, the economic burden and social burden of antimicrobial resistance if things stay the same, if it's business as usual for everyone, for business and government throughout the world. Um, nowadays, antimicrobial resistance leads to about 700,000 deaths annually. If things continue the rate they, they are, this might reach to 10 million deaths per year by 2050. Just to put that in perspective, this is more than all other causes of death combined. So, AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is set to become the leading cause of death if we don't take measures against it now, really. Um, also, to make things worse is the fact that we are using more and more antibiotics over the years. This is a study that came out a year ago comparing worldwide uh, consumption and prescription of antibiotics and we see that in red, most countries from the global south and emerging economies have increased the antibiotics used by significant amounts as their economies um, become better over time. And this is to show you a graph that depicts that upper middle income countries, in particular countries like Peru in South America, show and will show the greatest increase in antibiotics use as their economies develop. This is a good thing for economies because they can treat antibiotics better, but in the, in the end, this might lead uh, 
to selection of, of antimicrobial resistance. Another factor that influences the spread of antimicrobial resistance worldwide is that genes and pathogens and human populations migrate very rapidly. This is the case of the KPC and NDM, uh, carapenem resistance mechanisms, that originated KPC in the United States in the mid 2000s and a few years later, NDM emerged in the Indian subcontinent because of travel and movement of pathogens and humans. These mechanisms quickly um, became disseminated at worldwide scales. And so lead us to this graph where we see the different variants of carapenemases are now endemic or reported in multiple sites across the world. If you take a look, closer look at South America, you will see that at least this study from six years ago describes that KPC was endemic in Latin America, Peru was not sampled, and we will give you an update of that. How is it, how is it that bacteria become so resistant so rapidly? It shouldn't be a surprise at all because bacteria are really experts at exchanging and propagating genes to mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer. Uh, these are conjugation, for instance, transformation, transduction, that lead to the movement of genes, of a certain gene, of many genes, very rapidly across bacterial genomes, even of unrelated bacterial species. This is something that only bacteria can do and makes them very adaptable and very able to respond to antimicrobial pressures in the environment. So they quickly become resistant and these persistence phenotypes spread across bacterial populations. How is it that we study bacteria and how they become resistant? Nowadays, we're in the midst of a revolution uh, based on next generation sequencing. DNA, uh, DNA sequencing has over the years become increasingly cheaper and we are able to have increasing amounts of raw DNA sequence being analyzed. This is thanks to technologies from the likes of Illumina and Oxford Nanopore that can now give us many, many more reads compared to 10 years ago at much lower prices. What this means in the practice is that we are able to sequence beyond a single organism genome and into uh, pathogen populations. So this revolution in genomics that has happened in just a few years has led us to being able to sequence not just a single organism for a pathogen, but an entire population of diverse organisms that are isolated from different humans. And so that enables the study of outbreaks at local, international, national, and local scales, as well as in the long and short term. So now we're able to sequence the genomes of hundreds or thousands of isolates of variants of a pathogen population and start determining how is it that these individual isolates are transmitted and how they are evolving over time and over larger distances. These studies started coming out in 2012. This is one of the first ones by the group of the Evan Snitkin and Julia Segri at the NIH, where they studied an outbreak of carotenum resistant Klebsiella pneumonia it was, that led to um, fatal consequences in this hospital. They were able to isolate the Klebsiella isolates from these patients, and through holding and sequencing, were able to determine the sequence of transmission events. And this despite uh, the implementation of infection control procedures at this hospital that are meant to limit such infections. And this kept me thinking for a while, how would, it, how would this work? How would an outbreak of Klebsiella carapenem resistant would play out in Peru in the absence of such implementation of infection measures because of constrained budgets or infrastructure? But anyway, these authors were able to determine the sequence of events uh, with very high confidence, determining who passed the resistant pathogen to whom in the hospital, and determine the, the sequence of events from epidemiological and genomic records. Fast forward a few years, and these efforts that were 
limited to single institutions, single hospitals, can be turned into continent-wide surveillance. And this study just came out a few months reporting on 1,700 genomes of Tertiella pneumonia from all across Europe, and they determine the mechanisms by which carotenoin resistance is traveling. And in the end, the authors determine that uh, transmission is driven by nosocomial infections. This is just to show a phylogenetic tree with those 1,700 plus isolates and how they are classified into major sequence types. But within sequence types, you also see a clear indication of deeper variation that can only be achieved at the level of the genome and read through whole genome sequencing. But coming back to Peru and where we are coming from, uh, is that only in 2013, despite this carotenoid resistance in Klebsiella was being reported from a decade already, only in 2013 we start seeing these cases in the clinic. First reported as uh, individual cases, but we started seeing uh, Klebsiella pneumonia is one usual suspect and uh, through the KPC and NDM genes as well. But it wasn't until 2017 that I moved back to Peru and I started uh, setting up the local genomic infrastructure. Before I moved back to Peru, at, at least in my university and most of Peru, we were not using next generation sequencing for these types of applications. So it was our job to, to do the initial setup of the genomic infrastructure at our university but also we have to deal with the issue of bioinformatic analysis, which uh, was a great challenge for us because we lacked the resources to set up uh, sophisticated computer clusters. And that's when the solution of Kaya Gene Bioinformatics and their genomics workbench suit came to help us. Uh, this is very well integrated, all-in-one solution for bioinformatic analysis. And especially the microbial genomics module was really helpful uh, in helping us type and determine antimicrobial resistance genes in bacterial genomes. So check it out. The latest version is out now with an updated database of resistance genes that came very useful in this analysis. So around 2015, uh, our collaborators, clinicians, at the teaching hospital next door, we started dealing with this very worrying outbreak of Klebsiella pneumonia that was coropenor resistant. And by, by definition, this means that they're resistant to most last line therapy. So they are very hard to treat, leading to uh, casualty rates of 30 to 50% of all cases. So it's very problematic. And we can see that over the years, we see an increase of cases until the peak in around 2017. But this outbreak has continued into 2018 and 2019. And so far, we have reported about 80 cases in the last two years. So it's been very hard to contain. It's causing a lot of problems and uh, a lot of fatalities and morbidities down in this hospital. It came from a different variety of sources of types of infections. and from many different services in the hospital, but mainly from the intensive care unit, the ICU, was at the center of this outbreak, as is usually the case in these outbreaks. Uh, the intensive care unit um, holds patients that are, who have weak immune systems, and many times the, the hygiene protocols are breached. And so it's very easy for uh, outbreaks to start in these settings. For this one particular hospital, this is based in the north of Lima, which serves some of the poorest population in the city. It has been recently renovated, uh, probably 10 years ago. And this is how it looks like. Uh, what you, the first thing you will notice is that patient isolation is not possible. And that usually these ICUs should be working at 80% capacity. But given the high demand uh, from this hospital, it's always working at full capacity, making it even more likely that uh, pathogens will transmit between patients. So there is some degree of isolation, but not much. Um, 
personnel nurses are limited in this so that many many nurses are seeing multiple patients at a time. All these factors can influence the transmission of pathogens in these settings. There is some degree of isolation for the most critical patients, but that's not total isolation as you would expect in countries or hospitals that have more resources for this. And starting from uh, two years ago, now we, because the outbreak has been recognized, now there's daily sampling of surfaces and patients for surveillance studies. In the end, we isolated Klebsiella pneumonia from many sites from these patients, and this is what we eventually ended up with. Single isolates of Klebsiella pneumonia that were used for genome sequencing. So we collected about 80 Klebsiella isolates from 59 patients from the, from the first two, three years of the outbreak, and these were all sequenced uh, last year in our Illumina MySeq instrument using the standard Nextera XT library prep. We multiplex around 24 genomes per run, which leads to a coverage of about 20, 80x for every single base in the genome. This is enough sequencing depth to be able to type and differentiate between closely isolated cases. As mentioned earlier, we use the CLC genomics workbench and the CLC microbial genomics module to handle these genomes, to take us all the way from raw reads, we train them, the quality control, we can do species, species identification, multi locus sequence typing, and from there start building phylogenetic trees uh, using KMER based methods for quick reference trees or using SNP-based trees for high-resolution comparisons of related isolates. We can also perform de novo assemblies, and from those assemblies, find uh, antibiotic resistance genes using the risk finder application. And as mentioned earlier, uh, Kaijin just came out with a new curated database of antimicrobial resistance genes that has proven very useful for these types of analysis. First things first, we have to compare how all these Klebsiella isolates um, are related to each other. And this is a KMER tree that was based on the Illumina sequence reads. And this is, there's a lot of information on these, on these maps, but I'll guide you through it. First thing is that, well, we started seeing some differences in all Klebsiella genomes. It was immediately apparent that we are not dealing with a single clone that has been very success successful in this setting. Uh, in many cases of outbreaks, a single clone can overtake and cause uh, epidemics, but this is not the case. We see a lot of genetic diversity in this data set, to the point that it was not just Klebsiella pneumonia, a single species, but there were other Klebsiella species present. For instance, in patient 74, these are two isolates from the same patient, we identified Klebsiella michiganensis, which is a related subspecies of Klebsiella, and this was, uh, this was carrying the KPC enzyme. Later on, uh, we also identified a few isolates of Klebsiella quasi pneumoniae. Again, this is a subspecies by standard phenotypic methods. You wouldn't be able to tell this apart from Klebsiella pneumoniae, but it has some uh, unique epidemiological consequences, the fact that we found these. And uh, not just one, but two lineages were found. The first, in the first two years, 2015, 2016, is an unknown sequence type that was carrying KPC2. And uh, various patients at the ICU and the ER were carrying these variants. And there's some evidence of direct transmission within the hospital. Later on, 2017, Klebsiella quasi pneumonia came back, but this was a different lineage that this time was carrying the NDM enzyme. So it evolved separately from the previous one and was introduced into this environment as well. And the rest, the bulk of, of the isolates actually corresponded to Klebsiella pneumonia, but even there were, we found very high diversity of strains and lineages. Most of them uh, were NDM positive, and we found many different sequence types. Uh, on the left, you see that many 15 cases from the sequence type 45 were reported. This was the most abundant 
sequence type in our data set, but we also identify sequence types 219, ST11, 15, and 147. These uh, last few uh, have been reported occasionally in Europe and especially in the Middle East. Uh, so the fact that these are all showing up in Peru talks to how diverse, how successful Klebsiella lineages are in disseminating globally. Again, the conclusion from this part is that uh, there's multiple lineages uh, coming into the hospital and some of them becoming endemic. It's not just one lineage that was very successful and became epidemic, but multiple coming in and setting up residence in this environment, which is worrisome, which is complicated for infection control measures. This is just a graph uh, reminding us that ST45 was the most abundant one, followed by 219, 147, but in general, we saw a lot of genetic diversity in these sets. If we build a high resolution SNP tree, this is based on single nucleotide polymorphisms against a reference Klebsiella genome. And this enables us very high resolution typing and to determine how different related isolates are. So to the right, you will see uh, the ST45 isolates, 15 of them. And these differ from each other in just zero to four to five SNPs at a time. And, and that is highly suggestive of a single bacterium being directly transmitted between patients. So not only we have a lot of diversity coming in, but within the service, between different services, this is patients from the ER and the ICU, uh, the strains are being transmitted by physical contact probably. And we see a similar pattern for SD147, where we see zero to three SNPs, again, supporting the idea that this is being transmitted directly between patients in this hospital. If we look further into the genetic context in, in which these persistent genes are embedded, we find, unsurprisingly, that these are within the plasmid environments, which allows them to move very easily between uh, related lineages. And so NDM is traveling in three types, three variants of, of genetic context, all belonging to the, this INCS B family of plasmids. And KPC2 also is traveling along other resistant genes uh, surrounded by mobile genetic elements, which supports the idea that these genes travel very easily across bacterial genomes. That is not just MDM and KPC. These are only two of the most important for this case, but we, we see very high diversity of resistance mechanisms in this data set, which is not unexpected. Uh, we know that once Klebsiella get into a hospital environment, they tend to accumulate virulence factors and resistance genes. So the fact that we see these multiple levels of resistance is not surprising, but it's still worrying. In summary, uh, I just presented the work on genomic characterization on carapenem resistant Klebsiella in Peru. And the whole genome sequencing data suggests that these Klebsiella lineages have been introduced multiple occasions, multiple lineages over the three, four years since the outbreak started. KPC positive strains were first reported uh, supporting what's available in the literature. But later on, NDM1 positive lineages replaced these in 2016 and 2017 and became the dominant lineages uh, in this environment. We found some evidence of direct transmission between patients and across services, and infection control measures have been implemented despite limited resources and limited infrastructure. Yet, this has not been contained yet, and the outbreak is still ongoing. We have reported about 80 new cases in 2018, 2019, despite some evidence that the cases are coming down now. Uh, this is an ongoing project, and we will keep sequencing the new set of isolates coming in, and hopefully we'll report to you at a later date. So that's all the work that we had for today. Uh, we have to give many, many thanks 
to our collaborators, the clinicians working at uh, this hospital dealing directly with uh, these, these infections, and also to the people in my laboratory at Cayetano Herrera University, uh, where we study these and many other bacterial pathogens that are relevant to Peruvian public health. So that's it for now. Uh, thank you for your time and attention, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much.